Hello, I'm Sean Rehag. I'm the director of York University Center for Refugee Studies, and I'm a faculty member at Osgood Hall Law School. This video is part of the CRS Online Introduction to Refugee Studies. In this video, we'll be looking at the international politics of refugee protection. In particular, we'll be examining how politics shapes global refugee policy and how it structures access to refugee protection. People involved with refugee issues often use the term global refugee policy. This refers to proposed and actual courses of action that respond to concerns relating to the treatment and protection of refugees and forced migrants, as well as to the global coordination of these activities. Global refugee policy includes international treaties that define permissible behavior by national governments, as well as programs that are administered by national governments, international agencies, and non-governmental organizations to address refugee issues. Like all policy regimes, global refugee policy is not a coherent program, but rather a combination of norms, policies, and practices undertaken by a large number of actors whose priorities and motivations are diverse. It is important to remember that while there are laws and treaties that focus on refugee issues, the practice of refugee protection is also significantly impacted by policies in other areas, including human rights, labor, international development, and national security. The leading international organization working on global refugee policy is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, often referred to as UNHCR. The UNHCR is a forum for discussions among national governments and non-governmental organizations that work on refugee issues. The UNHCR is also an important institutional actor in its own right. It reports on conditions faced by refugees, it advocates for the recognition of refugee rights, and it provides services to refugees. However, the actions of UNHCR are constrained by national governments, since UNHCR is dependent on them for funding, and it can only operate within a country if it is given permission by the government to do so. There are two key international instruments that outline international refugee law and that provide a foundation for global refugee policy. These are the 1951 Refugee Convention relating to the status of refugees, often called the Refugee Convention, and the 1967 Protocol relating to the status of refugees. As discussed in more detail in the video on international refugee law, these instruments create a common refugee definition. They also outline the obligations that states have towards refugees. In particular, refugees are entitled to protection from refoulement or forcible return to a place where they face persecution. They are also afforded a series of economic, social, and political rights such that they are treated much like citizens of the country where they live. Unfortunately, these legal instruments and other international legal instruments that accord rights to refugees are somewhat limited in scope. This has led to a series of structural gaps in the global refugee protection regime. Three gaps are worthy of particular attention. First, there is no international mechanism to enforce the rights of refugees. Refugees are largely reliant on national governments to recognize them as refugees and to uphold their rights. They have little formal recourse if national governments fail to do so. Second, the refugee protection regime does not include any obligations for countries to protect refugees outside of their national borders. This creates an incentive for countries to prevent refugees from reaching their territory if they wish to avoid obligations towards refugees. And third, although the preamble of the Refugee Convention recognizes that the responsibilities associated with providing asylum may fall unevenly on countries and that refugee governance thus requires international cooperation, it provides no guidance on how those responsibilities can be shared. Thus, wealthy countries and countries that host very few refugees often fail to provide adequate financial or logistical support to countries that are home to large numbers of refugees. These three structural gaps are a result of the processes followed to reach international agreement on refugee issues. They are also a product of the political and national interests of countries that have been most able to influence those agreements. 
For this reason, it has historically been difficult to address concerns relating to responsibility sharing, durable solutions, and safe passage for refugees on the move. To understand how international politics continue to influence global refugee policy today, it's helpful to identify the two most common arrangements for hosting refugees. The first common arrangement is refugee camps, in which refugees live in spaces dedicated for the protection of refugees, usually quite separate from the citizens of the host country. The second is self-settlement, in which refugees live in rural areas, towns, or urban areas amongst the citizens of the host country. Let's look at each of these common arrangements in more detail. Refugee camps are most often created in neighboring countries as an emergency response to provide immediate protection and assistance to people who are forced to flee. Camps are frequently located in remote areas that are uninhabited and where there is space to build large amounts of housing and to be accessible to large vehicles or planes to bring in supplies. Camps may be run by UNHCR, by the host state, or by a collaboration of international and domestic non-governmental agencies. In many cases, UNHCR takes the lead, ensuring the registration of refugees, providing protection, and coordinating the provision of aid and services. Camps are designed to provide immediate protection in response to a sudden need, but they are not considered to be an appropriate long-term home or a durable solution for people who cannot live in their country of citizenship. Camps are intended to be places where people can live and enjoy basic protections until a durable solution is found. For refugees in camps, the options for durable solutions are typically local integration, resettlement in a third country, or repatriation when the risk has subsided. Yet durable solutions are too rarely available. The average length of time to remain in a refugee camp is 17 years, meaning that some refugees have lived in camps for much longer. Moreover, often conditions in camps are difficult. A Somali refugee living in a camp said that what the UNHCR offers in camps is only, quote, don't die survival, unquote, because while it provides the most basic protection, it fails to ensure other rights, such as the right to work, freedom of movement, and education. There are several barriers to durable solutions. First, many refugees in camps today fled conflicts that remain ongoing, meaning that few people believe it's safe for them to return to their country of citizenship. Second, many refugees in camps lack formal legal status and often do not have the same rights to work and attend school as local citizens. This leaves them permanently marginalized in the country where they are located, which in turn creates additional barriers to local integration or resettlement. And third, there are far more refugees in camps who are in need of resettlement than there are placements offered. For example, in 2018, approximately 1.4 million refugees were identified as being especially vulnerable and in need of being permanently resettled. However, only 92,000 refugees were resettled in 2018, less than 7% of those awaiting resettlement. Given these limitations, it's not surprising that refugees are increasingly moving on their own to places where they feel safe and have an opportunity to integrate. This group is sometimes called self-resettled refugees because they migrate to their intended place of settlement rather than living in a camp until they are offered resettlement. Although self-resettled refugees are not waiting for resettlement, many self-resettled refugees nonetheless face insecurity, threat of deportation, and long wait times before being granted full rights of residence in their host country, if those rights are available at all. The conditions of self-resettled refugees vary. In the Global South, self-resettled refugees are often tolerated, but their rights upon arrival are limited and there are usually few opportunities to receive full status or citizenship. For example, Egypt is a signatory to the Refugee Convention, but has asserted a number of reservations and the government has not passed domestic laws for refugee protection. Only a few high-profile individuals have been granted full asylum. Refugees who live in Egypt have limited rights to public education and to access the labor market. These limitations deny refugees full local integration. Another example is Kenya, which similarly lacks legislation on refugee protection. Self-resettled refugees in Kenya are vulnerable due to their lack of rights. However, studies also suggest that many refugees work or own businesses and are effectively integrated regardless of their legal status. 
In the Global North, signatories to the Refugee Convention generally allow refugees physically present on their territory to claim asylum, typically through a refugee determination process that is implemented by the state. While refugee claimants wait for a decision on their asylum claim, the rights to work, to social assistance, and to health care vary significantly from country to country. If the claim is successful, applicants are granted refugee status and may have access to most of the same rights as citizens. If the claim is refused, they may be subject to deportation. Three additional points about asylum seekers are worth emphasizing. First, the process can involve significant delays and backlogs. At the end of 2018, 3.5 million people were waiting on a decision about their asylum claim. Second, recognition rates for refugee claims vary from country to country. For example, in 2016, recognition rates for asylum seekers from Turkey were 85% in Canada, 49% in Switzerland, and 0% in Japan. Third, many people are unable to self-resettle in the global north because border controls prevent people from getting to a country where they can make an asylum claim. This last point is an especially important one in thinking about the international politics of refugee protection. So let's discuss border control and refugee exclusion in more detail. Many countries view control over who can come onto their territory and who can live there as a central feature of state sovereignty. And indeed, in the domestic law and politics of many states, there is a direct connection between sovereignty and border control. However, it is important to keep in mind that there is no necessary connection between sovereignty and border control. Many states that now closely guard their borders today have had periods historically where this was not a priority. Moreover, many states that have gone through periods of tightly controlling their borders have later opened their borders to regional cross-border movement, such as in the European Union. In addition, many developing countries opt to allow extensive cross-border mobility to encourage economic integration with neighboring states, and there are states that simply do not have the resources to practice strict border control. While countries can certainly be sovereign without exercising strict border control, it nonetheless remains the case that countries in the global north devote considerable resources to ensuring that asylum seekers never reach their borders. Under the Refugee Convention, states are bound by the principle of non-refoulement and thus may face legal challenges when attempting to return asylum seekers to their country of origin or to transit countries once they have reached their territory. Consequently, countries in the Global North have implemented an extensive range of strategies to deter and to intercept potential irregular migrants, including asylum seekers. These strategies often leave refugees stranded in places that are either dangerous or where they can only access emergency assistance. The measures that states in the global north use to discourage the arrival of asylum seekers on their territory can be divided into two categories. Non-entree strategies, which apply pre-arrival or at the border, and deterrent strategies, which affect asylum seekers once they have arrived in the country. Non-entree strategies are tools to intercept refugees and make it impossible for them to reach their destination. They take many forms. One is interdiction at sea. Government ships may intercept boats transporting asylum seekers and remove the passengers to another location, or the government ships may forcibly prevent the boat from docking or turn it back. In some instances, government ships have threatened to attack or have actually attacked refugee boats to stop their journey. Another non-entree strategy involves visa controls, carrier sanctions, and airline liaison officers. Countries in the Global North introduce rules stating that certain people need a visa to enter. Anyone who admits that they will make a refugee claim on arrival, or anyone who is suspected of potentially doing so, will be denied a visa. Countries then train local immigration authorities and airport and airline personnel to check for visas before allowing passengers to board. Countries may also station immigration intelligence officers or airline liaison officers to assist with training and also to independently identify people who are improperly documented. To enforce these rules, countries fine the airlines if they bring someone to the country who does not have the required visa. Another strategy uses regional agreements. Destination countries may make agreements with neighboring countries that are used as countries of transit by asylum seekers. Under these agreements, Local officials in the country of transit are trained to stop asylum seekers from traveling. 
This may occur in the area of the shared border, but it could also be on common transit routes or even at the border of the transit country. For example, the United States has shaped practices of border control at the Mexico-Guatemala border to prevent Guatemalans and other Central Americans from arriving in the U.S. to seek asylum. People may be detained in or deported from the transit country, making it difficult for them to reach their final destination. These agreements might also be used to pressure transit countries into becoming countries of asylum. For example, the United States has pressured Mexico to grant asylum to Central Americans so that they no longer travel to the U.S. to seek asylum. Another non-entree strategy that has increasingly been used is deploying criminal law to punish anyone who provides transportation or other assistance to asylum seekers. States are prohibited under Article 31 of the Refugee Convention from imposing penalties on asylum seekers who arrive in the country irregularly. Some countries, such as the United States during the Trump administration, openly breached this law and imposed penalties directly on asylum seekers. Most countries in the Global North, however, avoid imposing illegal penalties directly on asylum seekers, but many instead impose penalties on those who provide them with passage or transportation to the country. A final common non-entree strategy is safe third country agreements. These are agreements between states allowing for the return of an asylum seeker to a country of transit. They operate under the premise that refugees should request asylum in the first safe country that they reach, though I hasten to add that there is actually no requirement under international law that asylum seekers do so. At any rate, under the terms of these agreements, when asylum seekers present themselves at the borders of a state, they can often be directly turned back to the country that they just left. Okay, so that covers non-entree strategies. What about deterrence? Deterrence mechanisms limit the rights of refugees and reduce their chances of securing refugee protection. The hope is that other potential asylum seekers will learn about the poor conditions and will choose not to seek asylum in that country. There are several different types of deterrence measures. One is detention of asylum seekers. This was clearly seen in recent years in the United States, where government policies dramatically increased detention of asylum seekers and then began separating children from their parents to be detained apart. The objective was to make conditions so unpleasant that other potential asylum seekers would not make the same journey. Another deterrence measure is streamlining. With streamlining, the refugee determination process is sped up so that claims can be held more quickly with fewer procedural protections. Still another deterrence strategy is restricting asylum seekers' access to rights and entitlements, such as access to the labor market, access to health services, or access to legal aid. A final example of a deterrent strategy is the externalization of refugee protection. Some countries enter into agreements with other states to process refugee claims on their behalf. Processing claims outside of the physical territory of the state may allow the state to impose greater procedural limitations, and it may also allow the state to send asylum seekers to countries that are, for various reasons, less attractive. Whether non-entree or deterrence mechanisms are allowable under the terms of the Refugee Convention is a matter of some debate. Clearly, states cannot refool refugees. That is, they cannot send refugees back to countries where they face persecution. However, tools that prevent asylum seekers from reaching countries of asylum and tools that prevent refugees in the global south from self-resettling in the global north exist in a legal gray zone. The result is that states in the global north are able to avoid incurring responsibilities towards refugees while simultaneously insisting that states in the global south keep their borders open to refugees. This has resulted in unevenness and inequalities in responsibilities towards refugees. This has been a matter of extensive debate within the international community. The countries that are home to the highest number of refugees have arguably become so as a result of what some observers term accidents of geography. However, 
as we have seen, it might be more accurate to say that these accidents of geography have been vigorously reinforced by containment strategies used by countries in the global north. At any rate, whether as a result of geography or policy, most refugees live in countries that neighbor the country where they fled. 80% live in developing regions, and only a small proportion of refugees live in the global north. The five countries that hosted the highest number of refugees in 2018 are Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, Pakistan, and Uganda. In the same year, the five countries that hosted the most refugees as a percentage of their population are Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Chad, and Uganda. As a result of the uneven distribution of refugees, many have argued that the global refugee regime could be improved through international cooperation. This has long been an area of particular interest for UNHCR, as well as for states that are on the front line of providing refuge to a large number of refugees. Antonio Guterres, former UN High Commissioner for Refugees, put it this way, It is my conviction that the best way to protect the institution of asylum is through genuine international cooperation and equitable burden and responsibility sharing. In fact, there is one protocol that has yet to be drafted to complement the 1951 Convention. It is the one on international solidarity and burden sharing. However, it has been difficult to get countries to unify behind a system of cooperation and responsibility sharing because their interests are not aligned. Developing countries that host large numbers of refugees would like to receive more financial and logistical support for the provision of emergency assistance and to expand programs for resettlement of refugees in third countries. By contrast, countries in the global north that tend to be the top donor countries to the UNHCR and the countries that have the most power in the negotiation of international agreements tend to be more interested in how to further reinforce immigration and border controls to avoid incurring further obligations towards refugees. Thus far, these countries have refused to give the UNHCR or refugee hosting nations much influence in decisions about how many refugees they accept or which people will be resettled. Gil Losher writes that the UNHCR was created by Western governments in such a way that it would neither pose a threat to their sovereignty nor impose new financial obligations. This remains true of recent efforts at international coordination on refugees, including the new Global Compact on Refugees, negotiated in response to a sharp rise in asylum seekers making their way to Europe in 2015-2016. The Global Compact was affirmed by the UN General Assembly in 2018. It was designed as a framework to improve international cooperation and responsibility sharing on refugee issues. It seeks to ease the pressure on countries that host the most refugees, to expand third country solutions, and to enhance opportunities for refugees to be self-reliant. Not surprisingly, however, given that the Global Compact aims to achieve a more equitable sharing of responsibilities for refugees, countries in the global north ensured that it was a non-binding agreement. While some remain optimistic that the global compact offers a route towards increased international cooperation, the practical results have thus far been disappointing. There has not been a substantial increase in refugee resettlement and responsibilities for refugees remain as unevenly and inequitably distributed as ever. Overall then, as we have seen, global refugee policy emerges through competing imperatives. States attempt to balance their desire to provide protection to refugees for legal and moral reasons against their desire to advance other important economic and political objectives. States are also situated very differently in terms of their proximity to people in need of refugee protection and their capacity to block the arrival of asylum seekers. The result is that some countries, mostly countries in the global south, bear disproportionate responsibility for the bulk of refugees today. These factors shape the forms that refugee protection takes in different contexts. Unfortunately, they also shape outcomes when countries get together to discuss global refugee policy.